the establishment media's backing of Matthews and Durante, points to the existence of a larger policy to legitimize communism. Communism is the most absolute form of government, the highest concentration of government. And so you actually have in the communist system a rule by an oligarchic few, a rule by an elite. That is precisely what the Council on Foreign Relations insiders have been pushing for in this country and throughout the world throughout the past century. Uh, so there is a natural uh, uh, confluence of interest there, not an antagonism between the communists and uh, the uh, internationalists here in our government. They are both after the same thing. The elite, however, occasionally have a difficult time ruling themselves. At a 1991 closed-door meeting of fellow internationalists, billionaire and former CFR chairman David Rockefeller praised his media allies. But his confidence that his words would not leave the room was later broken. We are grateful to the Washington Post, the New York Times, Time Magazine, and other publications whose directors have attended our meetings and respected their promises of discretion for almost 40 years. It would have been impossible for us to develop our plan for the world if we had been subject to the bright lights of publicity. But the world is now more sophisticated and prepared to march toward a world government. Redirecting the bright lights of publicity is not the media's only contribution towards such a plan. Up next, discover how support for world government is generated as we examine some of the biggest stories in recent decades. The disturbing truth begins behind the big news. Literally millions of events occurring around the world every day, the media simply can't report on all of them. But like the Times slogan, all the news that's fit to print, the mainstream media implies that they can be depended on to report what is significant. What isn't made clear is exactly who or what dictates which events are newsworthy and which are not. This form of media censorship has proved catastrophic to American interests. In the midst of the Vietnam War, North Vietnamese leaders gambled on a bold strategy to achieve a decisive military victory in South Vietnam. Communist strategists believed a general offensive could trigger a civilian uprising and force America to abandon the war. Instead of their traditional hit-and-run guerrilla tactics, they massed their forces for a major confrontation with American and South Vietnamese units. On January 30, 1968, under the cover of a truce for the Vietnamese New Year, or Tet, communist forces launched a well-coordinated nationwide attack on South Vietnamese cities. The Tet Offensive had begun. Although caught by surprise, American forces responded quickly and effectively to the attacks. The main force Viet Cong were literally wiped out as a threat in South Vietnam. What was left of the communist forces from the north retreated across the borders. The Tet Offensive turned out to be a communist failure and a huge U.S. military victory. In America, however, media reports of the Tet Offensive communicated a much different message. The battle for Hue has taken an odd turn here. Americans were led to believe that the escalation in fighting proved that America, like the French, could not win in Vietnam. To say that we are closer to victory today is to believe, in the face of the evidence, the optimists who have been wrong in the past. To say that we are mired in stalemate seems the only realistic, if unsatisfactory, conclusion. But it is increasingly clear to this report that the only rational way out then will be to negotiate, not as victors,
but as an honorable people who lived up to their pledge to defend democracy and did the best they could. This is Walter Grand Guide. Good night. Even retired President Lyndon Johnson expressed anger over the misleading reports. Immediately, the voices just came out of the holes in the wall and said, let's get out. And that's what Ho Chi Minh had been trying to do all the time, was to uh, uh, win in Washington what he had won in Paris. To win in this country, um, in the homes of this country, what he could not win from the men out there that represented us. Communist leader and Viet Cong former Minister of Justice, Trung Nhu Tang, later confirmed the U.S. media's critical role in determining the outcome of the war. After the Tet Offensive, what we lost on the military front, we won on the diplomatic and psychological fronts. Above all, on the fourth front, the mass media, the press, television. We have just had, I've been advised, some film in from the defense. Even after three decades, the performance of the American press hasn't changed much. In 1998, America's attention was focused on scandal in the Oval Office. Public concern over this new round of suspected Clinton wrongdoings finally pushed Congress to act. However, news coverage implied that purely mean-spirited partisanship motivated the proceedings. The great story here is this vast right-wing conspiracy that has been conspiring against my husband since the day he announced for president. Suddenly, for the first time since Richard Nixon, a United States president faced the strong possibility of impeachment. Yet only a handful of viewers would learn the actual reasons why. Months before the Lewinsky scandal broke, Congress began investigating a scandal that had become known as China Gate. Evidence suggested that the Clinton administration had compromised U.S. security in order to finance its re-election campaign. The Communist government of China was eager to acquire sensitive U.S. military technology and economic concessions. Through international money laundering, China funneled contributions into U.S. election campaigns and obtained privileged access to top U.S. officials. The Communist money trail led all the way up to the Oval Office. If these facts were widely publicized, Clinton would face impeachment on grounds of bribery, and perhaps even treason. But the media misdirected public attention. Americans were told over and over again in a thousand different ways that the only real complaints against Clinton were that he lied about sex. Yet more than a dozen of Clinton's appointees, business associates, and close friends were convicted of felonies since he assumed office in 1993. Many others implicated in the Chinagate scandal invoked the Fifth Amendment or fled the country altogether. William Norman Grigg is a senior editor for the New American magazine. If Bill Clinton had been forced out of office as a result of the Lewinsky scandal, the damage would have been limited to him. And he was disposable to that extent. But if there had been serious attention paid in Congress and by the public to the implications of the Chinagate bribery and treason scandal, there was a whole host of institutions vital to the power elite that would have been implicated. The media cover-up of Chinagate was not simply to protect Bill Clinton. It was to protect the larger agenda that Bill Clinton had facilitated. That was the transfer of enormous technology, critical military technology, to communist China.